All right, good morning, everyone. It's Dr. Dan Ritchie, president of the Functional Aging Institute, and we are back. Functional Aging Summit 2021. This is the seventh annual, believe it or not, kind of crazy. Uh, I think I actually met CJ before the first Functional Aging Summit in 2015, so we've known each other a long time. CJ Easter is the owner of Fit Track Coaching and Lead Engine Marketing, and for the last decade, CJ has been a leader in Facebook advertising in the fitness industry. He brings a unique understanding of the science and the art of Facebook advertising with his background in engineering from Stanford University and 12 years of owning a gym. And I think he has owned multiple locations during that time. During that time, CJ has invested over $400,000 of his own money in Facebook ads. $400,000 in Facebook ad spend, and he's managed over $1.5 million in ad spend for his clients at Lead End Engine Marketing, and he's been running my Facebook ads for my studio for at least two years now and has managed tens of thousands of dollars in ad spend. Due to the pandemic, CJ has added a virtual platform to his gym business and built recurring revenues there as well. So, CJ, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, I'll be in the room if you need anything. Um, People, please stay muted uh, until CJ wants you to unmute. So CJ, thanks for being here. Take it away. You do have until 1230. That's a hard stop. Um, and we can do Q&A up until 1230 as well. So thanks. Got it. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for having me and appreciate the invitation to be here. And uh, we have a smaller, not huge group here today. So I'm going to make this a little, I, I like to be a little more interactive than just me talking at the, the screen here. So as interactive as we can be in the Zoom setting. So what I'm going to do, uh, a little different format. Normally I just go through the five mistakes uh, straight through and then take Q&A at the end. Um, what I like to do is talk specifically about one of the mistakes and then I'll open it up, allow you to unmute if you have any specific questions on what I'm talking about there. Um, and then, you know, I, I will reserve the right to punt if it's something that's going to kind of take us off topic. I'll, I'll take that Q&A at the end. But what I like to do is cover a topic. Uh, if you have anything related to that you want to ask, uh, I'll, I'll dive in there so we can make this a little more interactive since we got a smaller group. Is that okay with everyone? Give me a thumbs up if you're good with that. All right. So let's jump into it. So agenda, like I said, the five, five mistakes. And uh, well, uh, you know, we're, we're, I'm doing a talk here and Dan didn't pay for my travel expenses. So uh, I'm gonna make you an offer. If, if, uh, you, if you feel like you, you learned something from me and you'd like to keep working with myself and my team, there'll be an offer uh, at the end, special offer to work together and then we'll cover the, the Q and A. And the outcome goal uh, is to have you feel comfortable to invest in Facebook ads uh, to rebuild your business. Um, and the key word there is invest, right? Um, uh, Facebook ads are truly are an investment. That's a big part. Uh, you'll hear from me and my mentality is investing in Facebook ads because if you do them right, you're going to get a return on investment. Uh, and it, a common thing is that fitness professionals underestimate how much a client is worth in the long term to us. So uh, you make that investment you do the math, it's, it beats anything you could get uh, in, in the stock market um, if you uh, make the investment in your business. All right, so first mistake that I see is misusing Facebook ads. So the number one job of Facebook ads is to collect the name, email, and cell phone number of your target demographic for you to have conversations with them now or in the future, right? So what you wanna do is take conversations on Facebook, uh, you're paying for them, right? I don't know if you guys have noticed over the last years and it keeps dropping the organic reach of your, face, your personal Facebook page, your uh, business Facebook page is dropping. Facebook, if you wanna have conversations where you're trying to sell something to somebody, uh, Facebook wants you to pay for it. So you're not getting much organic reach, right? And you have completely no control. It's kind of random, right? Um, some posts you'll, you'll get lucky and you'll get a couple hundred other posts I put up there pretty much the exact same thing. I'll get three people that see it. Right. So, um, your goal is to take control of those conversations. So you want to get people's name, email, and phone number to have a conversation with them. Right. Um, and one thing to 
understand is that what I, I think uh, I'll dive into this further uh, in, in a future mistake, but uh, a conversation uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that person is always going to be ready to buy right now. Right. Uh, you just want to be able to control the ability to have a conversation, right? People on Facebook are going to be in different buying stages of their fitness journey. Um, so you want to get that information, but and once you have it, you can contact them now. Hey, they're not ready. Uh, you don't have to pay again to contact them, right? Uh, you now have control of that uh, information. And uh, just give me a, like, let's see if I can pull up this window so I can see. Uh, am I talking mostly to, is it virtual? Is it more virtual, more brick and mortar? Give me a thumbs up if you're like a brick and mortar person here. Or, or chime in. You can all go ahead and unmute yourself and chime in. Yeah, or type, type in the chat. Uh, are you a brick and mortar trainer, online trainer, combination? Um, you go ahead and put that in the chat for us. I see Bruno's in the room. I know Still Got It Fitness is a studio brick and mortar. Uh, about to open a second location. Online, online. Okay little bit so we got a little bit about 50 50 split here all right so i'll kind of talk uh in perspective of of both so for uh one thing people tend to do with facebook ads is they want to hop on and create uh brand awareness because they, that's what they see the big brands doing kind of like uh use facebook as an avenue to do a cheaper tv commercial right just oh we just want people to know uh, about us um in general for brick and mortar uh, gyms, brand awareness is, you know, uh, can be created through using direct response ads. And direct response ads means ads where you're asking for contact information, right? So you don't need to uh, dedicate extra budget to do brand awareness and just to have people know about you. You could have people know about you and also collect their name and email. And the, uh, the market for brick and mortars is typically pretty small. Um, like it's already pretty well defined. Um, so you don't need to do too much brand awareness because, you know, on Facebook, you're paying uh, $20 maybe to get in front of a thousand people. There's probably about 10,000 people in your target demographic within a five mile radius of your business. Um, and so that's in a, you know, couple of weeks, all those people are going to see your ads and they're going to start to be aware of you. Right. So, uh, I would say if you're going to take a budget and you want to do some brand awareness, uh, put like 90% of your budget towards direct response and then just a little bit towards brand awareness, more like get to know you type ads. Um, and for online businesses, what I, uh, I, in, during the pandemic started my own online business and, uh, you know, you have, you now can reach out to everywhere, everyone everywhere, right? But what I found was most successful for clients that made that switch was starting within like a uh, 25 to 30 uh, mile radius of their facility. Um, and that's because people, there's, there's just a, com there's a lot of online offers and there's a comfort level with kind of knowing like, oh, that I've heard of that city where this place is located, right? Um, and so starting in that, uh, radius as long as I mean if you're working with the 50 plus market there's plenty of people uh, within 30 to uh, 40 miles of your studio uh, that you could work with that uh, unless you're super niched right so um, yeah I would say you don't necessarily need brand awareness uh, there's a lot of internet marketers that are in the Facebook space uh, that are saying you need to do these type of special audiences, you need to build this type of audience, you need to track who's doing this, that, or the other. Uh, a lot of those tactics are for like marketing brands that are targeting people all across the country. They need to narrow down their audience, right? Because they have the ability to get to millions of people. Us, we're looking at somewhere between 10 to 20,000 people within our uh, radius. So there's not really the need to do those advanced tactics. Uh, it's focused on the, what's the most important and that's control those conversations turn that into conversations you own all right so any questions there if you want to chat them in 
if you don't feel comfortable unmuting. Any questions on brand awareness versus the direct response? Cool. So I will questions. Sorry, I have a quick question, yes. Adriana. Um, because I'm fairly new to this whole Facebook thing. But when you're mm -hmm. talking about an ad, are you talking about like just boosting a is that the same as boosting a post or is it different? Uh it's different. So uh -huh. we're talking about specifically being uh in your ads manager, so your Facebook ads manager, and uh, running an ad through there. Uh, so boosting a post is probably more in the brand awareness uh, style where I would recommend doing less of, um, but Facebook's just trying to get you to spend money, right? So they're always telling you, boost this post, boost this post, boost this post, uh, which is great for them, but it's less effective for us as gym owners. It's uh, better to get in your ads manager and be intentional about this is going to be an ad. I'm trying to collect name, email, and phone number for my target demographic. Okay, great. Thanks. CJ, I have a question. Yes. What would you suggest um, to do um, to collect those name, email address, phone numbers, um, you know, directly on Facebook where they can click and then Facebook, you know, comes up with a little window with, you know, name, address, phone number? or directing them to our own landing page? That's actually, I'm gonna, my, that's my next uh, topic. <laughs> so let me, uh, or might be a couple topics. I'm gonna cover that, so I'm gonna pause you on that question and we'll get to that. All right, Bruno. All right. All right, cool. So that was a good question, right? Yeah, good question. <laughs> All right, um, and so here we go. It is the next mistake. So not using Facebook's built-in optimization tools. So I think this already answers your question. What, uh, I believe in here. So uh, what's great about Facebook is uh, you, that they have built in tools. So some of the things they encourage us to do like boosting posts is they just kind of want to get you hooked and get you start spending money. Right. Uh, but in the long run, they want you to have success with your ads because uh, the incentives align. You have success, you make money, they will also make, make money. Right. Uh, so Facebook has some built in tools such as Facebook lead ads. Um, and so what that allows you to do, especially if you have less experience with the tech uh, side of things is you see this form here is already built out for you in Facebook. Um, and these forms uh, that are already built in Facebook, the cool thing about them is the name and the email and the phone number that the person has provided to Facebook is when they click on the link, uh, it's already within the form right? Because they already provide information through Facebook. Facebook automatically populates it right in the form. Um, so uh, going to a landing page would be like going to your own website and uh, taking them off Facebook. They have to fill in that form. They have to get on the computer, put in their information. So what we found is these, when someone clicks on it, they convert typically from like 25% to 40%. Uh, on a landing page, if you're getting 10% of people, so half that to a quarter of that, uh, your landing page is crushing it at 10%, right? So these have a much higher conversion rate. Um, what with these uh, and the higher conversion rate, you will get people that are less intentional about the opting because it is so easy, right? You'll get people that are less intentional and you, you might get some of those people that are like, oh, like I you know, didn't really mean to opt in. There's going to be some of those that are earlier on their journey. They're not ready to go yet, but uh, my belief, and like I said before, that's okay. Because some of those people, you get them on your list, you start a conversation, maybe it's not now, right? Not, but not now doesn't mean not ever, right? Then you can put them on your email list, uh, you can get content from Jay, um, and you could build value, build value, build value, and maybe that person a year from now uh, becomes a, a client for you, right? So uh, you do get some of those people that are less intentional because of this, but I think there's value in having those people on your list because over time they get at a different place in their, in their journey. All right. Other built in tool is campaign budget optimization. So um, this basically this tool, what it allows you to do is you take your budget for a campaign. Um, so let's say you're running a four week campaign. Um, you put your budget for the entire campaign in there. And let's say you're targeting uh, three different audiences, women 50 to 60, uh, men 50 to 60, 
uh, women 60 plus, right? You have those three different audiences. You, you don't know which one's going to perform best for you, right? So what you can do with campaign budget optimization is just put those three audiences in. And like it says, Facebook will optimize automatically for you. So it'll test it for you and see which audience is doing best and send more of your budget to the audience that's working well. Um, so this is awesome. You don't have to guess uh, and just let Facebook uh, place your ads to the people that are most likely to opt in to the ad. All right, and Dynamic Creative is another great Facebook tool. And uh, this eliminates uh, of the need to do a, a lot of split testing and different, uh, you know, a lot of advanced marketing tactics get people hung up. They, uh, do I need to split test this? Um, and split testing would be, uh, you take one image on one ad, another image on other ad, uh, and you see which ad works better, right? And then you take one headline on one ad, one headline on another ad, and see which one works better, right? And that could take a lot of time to set up and uh, watch the numbers. And it's something that often people just get kind of hung up in the details and they don't get started, right? Great thing about dynamic creative is you can let Facebook do that. So you put like three or four different images in there, two or three different headlines in there, Facebook, based on both that individual's like click history, as well as what's working overall to your audience, will send the version of the ad to that person that they're, they're most likely to interact with, right? So um, if someone has a history of clicking on uh, videos, they'll send them the video. If someone has a history of clicking on images, they'll send them the image. Um, so it's a pretty cool tool. The one thing I do suggest with Dynamic Creative is, uh, you, you do want to do a little bit of pre-testing, particularly with the images. So you want to make sure you have some winners in your images, right? Like you don't want to put uh, a, a bunch of duds in there. Um, and the Facebook is just rotating uh, images that didn't work. So you want to test them slightly individually, and then you could throw them in the dynamic creative and it'll optimize for you based on the individual preferences. So CJ, Yes. When you use this, you're going to have different sort of picture ads or video mm -hmm. ads and then Facebook chooses which ones to send out. Yes, correct. Okay. So um, it would, it would likely be offer the same offer. You're not going to put different offers in there. So it would likely be for off same offer. And then if your history shows that you click on videos more often, Facebook's going to send a video to you when you see the ad. Um, if I, it shows that I click on images more often, it's going to send images uh, to me. And then it's going to kind of like, you know, people like you do this. So they're going to send that type to that person. So it's going to individualize based on the past click history of people. Cool. So basically, these tools uh, uh, allow you uh, to get started without, uh, like, you don't have to build a landing page. You don't have to get hung up on that, right? You don't have to know exactly how much you want to spend on each market. You can let Facebook optimize that for you. You don't have to know uh, the perfect combination of things before you get started, right? So this allows, just kind of eases that learning curve and lets Facebook's algorithm optimize that for you. All right, is there any other questions on the, the built-in tools? All right. Oh, oh, there's one more actually. So this one's, uh, uh, sorry, I missed this one. This one's a pretty cool one. So uh, Facebook has eliminated the 20% rule. This happened probably about six months ago and it kind of snuck under the radar because there was a lot going on in our world. Um, but uh, Facebook has eliminated 20% rule, which means previously you can imagine this being a Facebook ad. There's some text at the top. Uh, there's a call to action at the bottom. This is the image, right? Previously, Facebook would only allow 20% of this image, so about where this uh, receipt uh, barcode is, as text, right? Now, you can use the whole image as text. They've eliminated that 20% rule, which means uh, the, most, the most important part of your ad is the words, right? The, the words is most important. So now, imagine this being a Facebook ad. You have a little bit here of text. You have a little call to action here. 80% of the real estate is the image. Right, so now you can use this whole image area and put text in there, right? And tell people what your ad is about because they may not read this little three lines here, but you put big text in here, they're gonna read that. It's gonna stop their scroll. It's gonna be different from what they're seeing. So that's a big change. 
And it also allows you to be more creative. So this is an example uh, of ad creative that we use. Uh, and it's, the goal is to get people's attention, right? So like you see a crumpled looking receipt, but we're putting our text of like the benefits of our program in this section here. And people uh, have commented on the ad. Why does, why does it look like a, a, a crumpled up CVS receipt, right? Um, and we, that's a sign of like, okay, it's doing its job, it's getting attention, right? People are stopping their scroll, right? Because that's no, rule number one of Facebook ad is you have to get people to, to stop their scroll, get their attention. Um, and this is an example of something, just being creative, doing something a little bit outside the box uh, where you can get their attention. You can use this text area here, um, you know, to uh, take advantage of what a lot of people don't know because a lot of people uh, have gotten ads rejected and just given up because they think the 20% rule is uh, still uh, in play, but it's not. And it gives you an uh, opportunity to do something different. All right. So number three mistake, and this is uh, a big one. If you're going to get into Facebook ads, uh, follow-up is huge. The money is in the follow-up. So uh, inconsistent follow-up is the third mistake. So, uh, I was going to call this slide the seven sins of follow-up, uh, but then I could only think of four. So this is the four sins of follow-up. It's not quite as cool as seven sins, but we'll go with four sins of follow-up. Um, number one is not tracking your follow-up, right? So, um, you know, uh, to make a fitness analogy here, right? Like the pain site isn't always the pain source, right? Someone might be having a knee problem, uh, but it's, uh, their, their hips not functioning correctly, right? So it's causing knee dysfunction, right? Uh, they might be having a knee issue or, and it might be a foot or ankle problem, mobility problem, right? Um, and so the same idea applies to a funnel that you're building in Facebook, right? So uh, you, at the end point, you might not be making as much sales as you would like, right? Uh, but there's multiple things in before that in the chain uh, that could be like, uh, dysfunctional, right? And in order to know, like it could be, uh, I'm not getting enough people on phone calls, right? What's, what's going on there? Um, uh, it could be like my text message, uh, I'm not getting responses to my text messages, right? What's going on there? And if you're not tracking those numbers, like what percentage of people respond to the first text? What percent of people get on the calls? Uh, of those people I get on calls, what percentage uh, am I closing? right? If you don't track those things, you can't diagnose what's going on, right? So typically what you'll do is you'll set a baseline, you'll track those things on your first campaign. And then it's not like, uh, you know, there, there, obviously there's probably a number you want to money make in terms of sales you want to make on it, but you set your baseline and the goal is to improve, right? Once you set your baseline, it doesn't matter like really what other people are doing, what other standards are. It's like you set your baseline, you track these numbers, uh, let's improve on those marginally. Let's improve 1% the next campaign. Let's improve 1% the next campaign, right? Uh, but there's going to be campaigns. Uh, it's, Facebook's not 100%. There's going to be campaigns where you're going to just have duds, right? And you're just going to be like, man, this isn't working. Uh, what's going on? And uh, that's when it's important to be able to go back to those numbers and see like, okay, uh, the number of people getting on calls is 50% less than uh, our last campaign, right? So we need to change something up in there to get people more calls, right? Um, so very important to track follow up and know your numbers. Um, and then the second saying that kind of along this line is lazy follow up, uh, just relying on automation. So uh, I know it's a bit of a, a lost art, uh, but picking up a phone and calling people uh, still, still works. And I know a lot of people don't like to do the work of, uh, I, I would call this warm calling because they are opting in. Uh, so it's not quite a cold call, uh, but an unscheduled call, just picking up the call, the phone and calling somebody uh, is a great way to, to get a hold of people, particularly if you can catch them like right after they uh, opt in. So we get about a 60% uh, call pickup rate if we call them immediately after they opt in, right? And that's uh, much higher than any other uh, means uh, text messages, emails, anything like that. So don't just sit back and wait on if you have email automation, particularly email automation, because uh, email is just getting 
tighter and tighter for us as business owners to get in the main inbox, right? Like uh, Apple just came out with some more privacy stuff. Uh, Gmail uh, is moving towards more privacy as well. Uh, it's just getting tougher and tougher for us to not be in the promotions tab uh, or even in the junk tab, depending on what volume of email you're sending out. So uh, waiting for people to respond to emails is definitely not uh, the way to go. You want to be proactive. And uh, if you have the bandwidth to do it, when someone opts in, uh, catch them while they're hot. Pick up that phone, call them uh, right away and start that conversation uh, right away. And uh, the third sin of follow-up is being emotionally tied to responses. So uh, like I showed you before with the Facebook lead uh, ads, it's fairly easy for people to opt in, right? And because of that, you're going to get some people that are, uh, you know, uh, some people are going to be rude. Uh, you're going to get like, uh, and some people are going to lie to you. They're going to tell you, I didn't opt in for that. Uh, well, it's your name, it's your email, it's your phone number. You probably did opt in for this. Um, and some people are going to be mean. They're going to use explicitives. Uh, it's when you're getting high volume of leads, uh, it's going to be part of what's going to happen, right? But uh, the key is to not be emotionally tied to the responses, right? Uh, basically, the goal is uh, to, it's binary. It's either yes, this person is interested right now, or no, they're not interested. And if they're interested you if they're not interested then the goal is to figure out is it a no right now or is it a no forever right so it's a yes you continue that conversation uh you get them started in your program see if it's a good fit no uh if it's a no forever you could just eliminate them off your list if it's a no right now uh, then you put them on your list of contact in the future right um and then the third category is no response you just add them to your list for future conversations right um, the, the key thing is, yeah, just it's binary, uh, regardless of how they say uh, no, it's, uh, you know, nothing to be emotionally tied to. And I think that's um, a big adjustment for fitness professionals first getting into Facebook ads, um, because you go from mostly getting referrals, uh, getting leads from people that you know, you're closing nine out of 10 people, right? When you start getting into Facebook ads, if you're closing uh, one out of five, one out of eight people, you're doing a great job, right? So um, that's definitely a key with that is to not be emotionally tied to the, the you know, it's just a higher volume gain. It's going to be a different success rate. All right. And the last in a follow-up is uh, not consistency, consistently leveraging your email text list. So uh, what I got here all right, so I want you to screenshot this. So this here is worth your price of admission. Um, if you have an email list or text list, I'm pretty sure you could take this uh, this afternoon and send this out to your list and get enough interest to pay for your travel costs to the seminar. Um, I call it, there's, a, there's a cool one that's called a 10 word message that's kind of gone around marketing circles. This one's not as cool. Uh, it's a 40 word message, uh, but there's a couple tactics we're doing here. Um, and this can be sent via text or email, but this is assuming email. So subject line, uh, if you have an email software, uh, you should be able to put the first name and last name in there, like their actual first name and last name, not these placeholders. Right. Uh, so, uh, email subject lines with a person's name get way better open rates. So like typically we'll get about 20%. I have a pretty large email list. We'll get about 20% open rate on ours. With emails like this, it'll be 40, 50%. Uh, so it's almost doubles the open rate when you have their name in there. There's a lot of cur curiosity. Um, and then there's just uh, a reminder of like, I, I guess I call it, it's, it's almost like shifting the power dynamic, right? Because you've probably followed up with this person before, you've sent them some emails. Um, so I remind them that you reached out for my help, right? It's just kind of shifting that mental uh, power dynamic a bit and then follow that up with, I'm not giving up on you, right? Like that's, it's, it's my job. I'm a coach. Uh, I'm not going to give up on you. Right. That's kind of just a mental shift we're trying to create, uh, there. Um, and then just keeping it super casual. Are you open to a quick chat to see if it's a good fit for us to work together? Um, and then, uh, yeah, you, you send this out and typically this is what we do monthly. Um, so we'll do with our email software, uh, send this out, uh, 
uh, on a Monday uh, to begin the month, and then we'll send it out uh, to the unopens the next Monday. So most email software can see who doesn't open an email, and then you'll be able to send it out, uh, resend it in the next week. Um, and then the following month, we'll send out a similar message via text message, right? So this is great. And then all you got to do is really just kind of change up the call to action. Um, you know, so a recent one we sent out, uh, this was just last week, uh, was like, hey, things are starting to get back to normal. Uh, so I wanted to reach out to you uh, again to see if we could help. Uh, uh, now that you're having a new routine, are you interested in making exercise part of that routine? Right, so that's not quite as, it was a little bit smoother when we wrote it, but something along that, right? You take a similar email um, and just use it every single month, basically. And you'll get uh, a few com more conversations every month. So it's very important to do that because most people, uh, they follow up for the first week um, on their ads and then their email list just sits there dead. Um, and newsletters are great um, and a great way to show value. Uh, but one thing like kind of newsletters lack in at times are the call to action. Like this is a direct call to action. We want you to do something. Newsletters often the call to action might be at the bottom. And, you know, if you watch the heat maps of what people read, they read the first top paragraph and then stop reading after that. They never get to the call to action. So this puts it right at the top. Uh, they know exactly what's going on. So good one. This will pay for your travel costs here. CJ, real quick, Sherry asked, because you were talking about phone calls. Yes. Uh, in this era of mass telemarketing spam calls, how can we reach people by phone when most will screen our calls? Do you have any tips for that or who you choose to call? Um, so there's, I don't really have any tactics for that, like uh, to get around that. Uh, most people aren't going to uh, pick up their phone, but we have had success with calling right as soon as they opt in calling right away. So that's being been the big thing. And what we do in the ad text, uh, like the thank you screen of the ad, we'll say uh, be, be alert from a phone call or a text message from a number you might not recognize, right? So they see that and then we call them right away um, and it kind of aligns. But yeah, I don't have any like technology or cool hacks to, to beat that. Um, it's just, so it is a little bit of, is, you know, a little bit of grunt work. It's not going to always be the most efficient work. Uh, but if you're willing to do it, it's one of those things that adds up a little bit. It's one, one client here, one client here, you know, uh, over time. Right. So, uh, it's, yeah, it's definitely not as efficient, but, I, there's a balance between efficient, efficiency and effectiveness. You have to find that works for, for your business and your time. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, and mistake number two here is uh, using past performance as a benchmark. All right. So Facebook ads are becoming increasingly competitive. So the win by default days are, are largely gone. Um, and so, I mean, there's a caveat to this because in the 50 plus and 60 plus market, uh, People assume that uh, you know 50 plus, 60 plus are not using Facebook, which is a, a wrong assumption. Um, so there are some markets that there are some still some wins by default uh, opportunities um, in the 50 plus and 60 plus market, right? So uh, th that's a little caveat. You might be in your community, the only person marketing 50 plus, uh, 60 plus, and you might win just because of that. And uh, important takeaway from that is in your ads, you need to make sure you address like uh, that this is specifically for people 50 plus, right? Cause that'll catch their attention. And uh, I know the people uh, that have worked with me uh, have gotten that response of, yeah, I clicked on this ad because uh, it's uh, 50 uh, because it's 50 plus and I've never seen a fitness ad for someone over 50. Right. So uh, yeah, there are some opportunities, but in general, Facebook ads are more, uh, competitive. So it's kind of like, um, I don't know if any of you were in the industry back in the, when Groupon was booming, right? Uh, you, back in the days when Groupon was booming, uh, you could do, uh, for example, my business, this was just like right when we first started. So this was maybe 2000, 
10 we did a Groupon. And we put up a Groupon. Uh, we got 700 people to buy it in the first 24 hours. And we had no idea what to do with them, right? Uh, but it was just like a win by default type deal, right? And Facebook ads, 2012, 2013, uh, probably all the way up to like 2016, you could just put anything up and other people weren't doing it. So you would get all the leads, right? Um, it's not like that anymore. It's basically law of so supply and demand, right? Uh, if something's working, other people are going to see it's working uh, and they're going to want to get in. Uh, the uh, supply is relatively fixed for Facebook ad placements, right? Um, and the demand is higher, right? So that's going to mean that the ads are going to be more expensive, right? Um, and also other thing coming into play uh, for those of you that are brick and mortar, um, you know, coming out of the pandemic is more uh, at home uh, options competing for the high end fitness market, right? Where the typically most people that I'm talking to are in the $100 plus per month uh, range, right? And that's the high end fitness market. There's more, there's the, uh, the, the Peloton, uh, there's uh, even businesses like mine are now online, right? So we're, uh, there's more people that are competing in that market, more options. Um, so what that means is that uh, comparing to like expecting your 2021 results to be like your 2000, even your 2019, 2018 results is kind of a futile comparison, right? You can't run ads in the past. Um, so looking at the way it worked before is not the right way to look at it. What you want to look at is like in the present market, is investing in Facebook ads a better opportunity than the other opportunities out there, right? Even if it's not performing as well as before, is it still better than the other opportunities I have with this uh, $500 a month, right? So that's what it is, uh, how, how you need to look at it, not compare it to the, to the past. Um, and I, I use my business as, as an example. Um, you know, our ads are not working nearly as well as, as the past. I've been doing them since uh, 2012, we've pretty much saturated our area with ads uh, doing it for that long. We continue to spend uh, $20,000 a month in Facebook ads because uh, it's just a better opportunity than uh, any other thing that, that are out there. All right, uh, any questions on this, the competition and how to yeah, uh, how do you position a Facebook? I like one of the things about you said like age and stuff, but mm -hmm. Facebook won't let you put age or gender on in, the, let, in the they, ads. They will let you do both. You could, uh, yeah, we put that in every single ad that we do. Uh, I've been stopped every time. Okay. Um, so why don't we do this? So I will share my email at the end of this. Uh, send me a screenshot of that ad and I'll take a look at it individually because I can't, it's hard for me to diagnose. Okay. You know, uh, but uh, you can, it's, it might be something, it, because Facebook's when they paint, when they, uh, you know, they uh, decline your ads, it's kind of broad what they say, right? Um, but you can, you can, Bruno is the guy, Dan also, have run my, we use gender and age in every single ad that we do. That's kind of like one of our core tactics is do exactly that. So it can be done. Uh, I, I set, uh, I'll connect with you after this. Send me a screenshot and I'll be able to diagnose what it might be. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, would you mind muting yourself again? Uh, is that Mary, I think? Thank you. All right. And so the number one mistake is uh, quitting because measuring ROI wrong. So this is again about knowing your numbers. And what I mentioned at the beginning is knowing how much a customer is worth to you in the long run. Uh, we often uh, underestimate that. Like a client we get uh, typically sticking with you probably a year plus in most of our businesses. Uh, that client is now going to be worth, you know, maybe $100, $200 times 12, 16 months, right? Uh, so that's important to take account to that. It's not just that first sale you make in the first month when you're measuring your return on investment. It's that long-term value of a client, right? And because uh, fitness professionals are often measuring this wrong and just looking at, I need to flip my money this month, uh, they're losing out on uh, return on investment in the long term. So 
Um, I'll take you through an example here. Here's like a typical thought process. Um, so someone is spending uh, $500 in ad spend um, and they get 50 leads out of that, right? Um, they'll sell four FEOs as front end offers. So that might be your, you know, 21 day trial or whatever it is. And let's say you're selling at hundred dollars each, right? And then kind of the wrong mindset would be, oh no, 46 people rejected me and I lost a hundred ads because I sold four at a hundred, I spent 500, right? And so that's kind of like the short term thinking is that uh, it's not working. My ads aren't working, right? I lost a hundred dollars on the front end, right? Um, but that's not taking into account the long-term value of a client, right? So here's kind of how it should be looked at so you could uh, uh, get your return on investment in the long run. So if you spend uh, $500, so same thing, $500, get 50 leads, you sell four at $100 each, right? It's not 46 people like didn't sign up. You have added 46 people to your email and text list, right? Probably uh, over time for about 10%, four or five of those will eventually become people that you have conversations with to work with you, right? So uh, those people add to your list, it just wasn't good timing for them. And then let's say you convert one out of four of those people to a membership. So that's being conservative, right? I think most people convert more than 25% of the people to their memberships. Um, and let's say that person sticks with you for six months, right? So now um, that person had, had six months at a hundred dollar membership, uh, that's $600 there, right? So you look at your lifetime return, you made 400 on the front end, you converted one member, made $600 on them, uh, and that's, you've made $1,000, right? So you spent 500, you've made 1,000, in six months, you've made a 200% return on investment, right? Um, and then this is something that could be repeated month after month after month. Not every month is gonna be, you know, some months you might have a dud, uh, but, uh, what's often misunderstood is that it's not just about this front, this first hundred dollars, right? It's about the long-term value of, of the clients. And that's often why fitness professionals are underestimating uh, because they're not willing to put the cash up front uh, to make that investment, right? You do have to put the cash in the ads though, right? Like you have to be uh, willing and able to do that. All right. Any questions on, on that? I'm a, my degree's in engineering, so I'm a math guy. So this is easy math for me, but I know it's not the case for everybody, right? Any questions about uh, this and how to frame it, right? And from a uh, like business owner standpoint, right? Like uh, think, think of your business as part of your like larger portfolio, right? Like uh, there is, uh, you know, you have the stock market, you know, uh, you might be invested in cryptocurrency, you might be invested in bonds, you might be invested in this, right? Um, you know, your business is an investment in the same way, like you allocate money across your portfolio, your business is an opportunity to, to, for you to do that as well, right? And that's thinking like a, uh, not just a business operator, a true business owner, right? Um, so that's the way I try to think about things and, uh, you know, how much of my cash I'll be putting here versus investing this versus investing this versus investing in this. And the cool thing about investing in your business is ultimately, uh, you know, you're most in control of the results, right? Like, you know, you're not in control of everything in your business, but you have the most control of the money you put in there, right? It's really uh, mostly a meritocracy, right? Versus the stock market, like it's basically chance, right? All right. CJ, I would just add to that because I think, well, one, I think what we have seen is FAI trainers, their their average member lifespan is more like 18 to 24 months. Uh, clients in this age range that sign up stay for a long time because they don't have a short-term goal. They're, they're long-term health focused. So that's one big thing that I think changes even in this this age demographic I'm more willing to lose money on the front end because I know the customer is worth two to three to four years of, of lifetime value. But, but I look at what you're saying and say, if I had to pay a hundred dollars, lose a hundred dollars essentially and get four customers, right? Cause at the end of the month, it's like basically four people paid me 400. I paid 500 to get them. I paid a hundred dollars to get four new customers. I should be willing to do that all day long, every single month, month after month after month, because 
those four new customers are going to keep paying me in most cases for the next two to three years. And if I do a great job, maybe five to, to seven years. So, so I think th this slide explains it really well. I think sometimes people, they think they're losing money on their Facebook ad spend when the reality is they're not losing money. Um, there's a cost to it, but the return on investment is huge long-term. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's actually, it's, yeah, it's pretty hard when you're making thousands of dollars like that. Let's say it's, you know, 18 months, so it's roughly a customer by $2,000, right? It's really hard uh, to lose, you know, $2,000 on Facebook ads, unless you're just like flushing it uh, down the drain, not getting any leads, right? So um, yeah, most fitness professionals are under spending. It's just that uh, in the past, uh, most have not done paid advertising. So they're not, you know, it's used to referrals, which there's, you know, referrals, there's some time cost there, um, but they're not used to like putting in dollars. So it, it feels like a huge dollar amount that's being put in, right? Uh, because it's being compared to like before referrals when no money was being put in, right? So it's, but it's important to understand that uh, at a certain point, if you want to grow, like you can grow your business to a certain size with just referrals. Right. But at a certain point, if you have ambitions of growing beyond uh, like that circle of people, uh, you have to be willing to buy customers. Right. And trade one hundred dollars, uh, one hundred dollars today for two thousand dollars in uh, 18 months. CJ, um, I have a question. Do you see that spending more money increase? Um, the value of each customer, meaning that if you spend $500, you get one client. So if you spend 10,000, you know, so you multiply that by 20. So um, are the numbers better, you know, uh, everything being equal, are the numbers better if you spend more money? So yeah, you're basically, uh, it, it is not linear, right? So it's not gonna be, you make, uh, 200% ROI, you double your money, right? At 500, you're, you're not gonna double your money at 5,000, right? It's not gonna be a linear relationship because uh, there's basically a law of diminishing returns. Um, your market is particularly brick and mortar. There's gonna be 10 to uh, 20,000 people in your area, right? That are gonna be within your target market. And then only a certain percentage of that are gonna be able to afford higher end services, right? So it's, it's uh, as you go forward, it's generally like a, the, you're going to kind of reach a, a, a peak, right? Um, and then at that, yeah, so you don't want to keep, if you kind of see it, that's a matter of knowing your numbers, you start to see it flatten out. It's just a matter of like, okay, this is our flattening point. Let's just stay, let's be consistent here, right? Uh, but the problem is most, if you do the long-term math, most people never get to that, aren't spending enough to get to that peak. How do you know? How do you know? I mean, you've got to look at your numbers, but you know, it's like, it, it's, you just got to be constantly have to monitor, I suppose. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's, it's constant. It's probably a monthly ca calculation of basically like you have to, there's, um, okay. So let's say you make, uh, so, so with our businesses, there's a fixed cost of like our overhead, our gym, our people cost, right? That's a fixed, right? Uh, and then there is basically from there, uh, there's very little variable costs on adding new clients, right? So let's say like each new client you add, you want to make a 30% margin on that new client, right? So let's say you're making $2,000, right? On that client. Uh, you want to make a 30% margin, right? So you want to take home $600 from that client. I mean, you can spend up to $1,400 to, to uh, get that client, right? Knowing that you're going to make 2000 on it, right? So it's like, okay, uh, this month I look at the numbers uh, based on my conversion percentages, I'm spending more than that number. Based on my conversion percentage, I'm spending less than that number, right? So you just kind of monitor that and uh, you okay. know, shift your ad spend accordingly. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. And so uh, the conclusion here is uh, when executed well, uh, Facebook ads are still 
uh, the best opportunity in paid advertising for most fitness businesses, right? So there's other opportunities out there, uh, but particularly the 50 plus market, uh, we've tested Instagram, not, there's not enough, uh, as much users there as with Facebook and not enough users responding to ads like they do on Facebook for the 50 plus market. Uh, there's Google ads as well as another paid advertising opportunity, a big one. And the thing about Facebook ads is that you control the dial in a lot of ways. So the conversation I just had with Bruno, like you could turn up your ad spend, you could turn down your ad spend versus Google ads. You're basically, number one, you have to make sure you're guessing the right search terms. And then number two, you have to um, have enough people in your area that are searching those search terms, right? So you don't really control the dial as much with Facebook advertising. So in terms of like having control and predictability in the growth of your business, uh, Facebook ads are that best opportunity. Um, should, but one of the things that also ends up happening that I want to advise you against is just, just Facebook ads, right? Some people like jump in with us, they'll get so much success with the Facebook ads. Uh, that's all they stop doing their other marketing things they were working in the past. Right. And they reach that there's, there's a point of diminishing returns. They reach that point where it starts to flatten and becomes more steady and uh, they stop doing those other things. Right. So with marketing, uh, you want to have multiple poles in the water. So you want to Facebook ads should be in, in addition to the things that you're doing that are already working. It shouldn't be the only thing that you're doing. All right. All right. So quick offer here. Wanted, uh, like I said, if uh, I gave you some value here, I uh, hope you stick around and hear me out. Uh, if I didn't, uh, feel free to hop off. I, I can't see most of you anyway. So I promise you my feelings won't be hurt. And it's a lot less awkward than walking out of a, a hotel ballroom if we were in there. So um, if you'd like to work with us, um, just tell you a little bit about lead engine marketing. Um, the big thing we bring to your business is consistency and predictability. Um, so we're going to consistently get you uh, leads in the door. You won't be chasing down uh, leads and you're going to be able to, okay, we know we're going to typically get in this range of leads. We're typically going to get this many conversations. We're typically going to close this many people to FE, FEOs. Um, and I know uh, Dan could probably attest with this. It's, it's almost like a plug and play portion of his business at this point. He knows we're going to get him this, this many leads. Uh, and he just does the math from there and it's predictable for his business. Uh, other thing is, uh, unlike other marketing agencies, like we're running a brick and mortar um, and we invest our own money. Like the ads that I'm running with my clients, uh, I'm not testing with uh, our clients' money. I'm testing with my own money, uh, trying things in my own business. Um, and the same ads that you're running, I'm running almost exact same ads in my, my business. Right, so it's like we're putting our money in where our mouth is and have skin in the game. And on average, so Dan's been working with us for, I think it's been three plus years probably now. And on average, uh, our client, active clients have worked with us for 5.3 years. So uh, if you've ever worked with agencies, uh, you probably know that that's, that's a really, really long time to be working with an agency. And that's because of the, the consistency people, uh, you know, there's not a lot of bells and whistles what we're, with what we're going to do. We're not going to do the fancy stuff, but we're going to provide you with consistency. You're going to know what to expect with us. Um, and, you know, it allows it to be a long-term uh, relationship. And here's the offer. Uh, you sign up next week. Uh, so you, the next step would be to set up a call with us. Uh, we're we're going to let you try us for free. So we'll give you first month. Uh, typically, there'd be a $500 setup fee and $500 monthly. Um, we'll let you we'll waive that, let you try us for free. Uh, all you'd have to uh, cover is the ad spend. So typically we recommend our clients start with $500, uh, ad spend. Um, and as you could, you could see the math, like it's pretty reasonable that, uh, you know, if you're doing your job with your follow up, you, you should be able to get a return on investment, uh, within the first, uh, three to six months. All right. Um, and you could screenshot this, uh, lead engine marketing.com slash gym growth reboot is the website. Uh, take it to our sales page and that's where you could click on the call to action button and schedule a call with us. So, uh, next week offering you guys a free month so you could try us out, see if it's a good fit. Cause I know for some people like, uh, 
this stuff can be overwhelming. Like I cover a lot of information um, and you want to get started, but you just don't know how, right? So that's where we come in and uh, can do it for you and, and bring some consistency in your business. And that's all I got. So questions. Awesome. Thanks, CJ. Uh, that's a, that's an amazing offer. Uh, if you're struggling with Facebook ads or considering starting them, you should definitely take them up on it. Um, yeah, we've been using CJ, I think. I think uh, September of 18 will be three years, I think, but, uh, but I lose track. So, um, and I just looked in our text magic account, we have over 900 leads uh, and we're cleaning that out every year too. So um, CJ has typically been getting us between 75 and 80 leads a month, um, which is a lot of leads and a lot of follow-up. So uh, any questions for CJ? We've got about four minutes left. Um, any other questions? If you want to type it in the chat, go for it. Um, I know somebody here, uh, Mary, um, wants to follow up with you on the, the age-related ads. Because I know most of our ads will say, hey, we're looking for 10 women uh, over 50, or we're looking for 10 men in their 50s. Or So there are certain ways to do that um, and not get dinged or denied. Um, uh, Medexon's asking, do you work in Canada? You run any ads for yes. uh, Canadian studios? Yes, we do. Okay, yep. I thought so. Uh, so we have, we have a couple, uh, it's been rough for the Toronto area, but we, the pre, pre temp pandemic, we had a couple in the Toronto area. Um, and then one more Alberta, uh, Canada. So yes, we have worked with, uh, Canadian clients. And the great thing about Canada, uh, is that the ads are a little bit cheaper in Canada as well. There's generally a little less competition. So, uh, I know there's a exchange rate, uh, that's, uh, doesn't work as well for Canada. Uh, but, uh, generally leads are cheaper there. Okay. All right. Well, um, you've got CJ's website. Um, we will put in the follow-up notes as well um, the special offer you offered, CJ, so people looking at the replay can check that out. Um, thanks again, everyone. There is a – remember, there's a, this is a lunch break now, 1230 to 130, uh, but there's a live uh, Q&A with Martin Pisani, our keynote speaker this morning, as well as his whole Activate team. So if you want to pick Mike and John's brain or Maria and Adam, um, Activate is hosting the live uh, lunch session. So jump in that room. It's a different room than this one. So, all right, take care, everyone. Uh, live sessions again at 1.30. See y'all. Right. Thanks, Thank, CJ. Thank you guys for being here. I appreciate it.